Hello there. <clears throat> this is Franz Cantor, cartoonist, illustrator, toon talker, and um, here without my safety net today. Um, actually, drawing. Um, I'm drawing this guy. I'll tell you why in a sec. Why I've got no safety net. This is Peter Sellers. I don't know if you can make make that out the uh, the brightness. I have got no iPad today, so I usually have like a the reference material. I keep quite close to the paper. So that's why I've got no safety net. So I've got to look over onto the left-hand side a little bit more. Okay, all right, let's, uh, let's have a talk about this. Um, I've done a little uh, quick thumbnail based on that, that face. I kind of like that uh, look. And it's sort of like a, I would liken it to a peanut with you know, slightly larger proportions at the top. So it's a peanut-shaped head. Okay, now why is this important? I'm asking, why? <laughs> it's important because um, you need to think about what the shape of things are in a very simple, simplistic, symbol-making way, if you like, because that is an entree into the more difficult uh, shapes or the details. So when you look at a face, people find faces very intimidating to draw. And the reason why they find that is because um, they don't know how to approach it. They don't know how to approach it in a drawing. So the best way to approach any drawing, whether it, depending on, on well, it, irrespective of, of, of who it is or what it is, is to think of it in terms of its basic, simple shape. And from there, we can extrapolate details. We can layer details on top. Okay, so that also gives you the ability to use when you're doing caricature, of course, you're, you're exaggerating a lot of the shapes that you're seeing, okay? So rather than just a, a normal shaped head where you would try to uh, emulate, you know, even spacing and proportions and things, you're actually exaggerating a lot of those proportions. So we've got a light source which is kind of uh, favoring the right-hand side of the object. Yes, we're calling him an object now. And that means that the shadow area will be on, to, on the left. So that is in the back of our mind when we're um, referencing all of the features on the face. Another thing to remember, of course, because of the, um, the nature of caricature relies on recognition factor. So the recognition factor in a face is the eyes, the nose, and the mouth usually 99 times out of 100 you know unless they have very particular ears you know um, then they become like a symbol you know who is that um, so the area we call this the area the mask area because it kind of looks like a Mexican mask with, you know um, Mexican wrestler mask um, also known as the T-zone, which also comes from um, makeup because this is the area where oils uh, tend to um, uh, uh, centralize. Okay, oils are, are like things that replenish the skin. There's a lot of activity around the face, you know, a lot of movement, muscles pulling and pushing, and um, they leave lines, they leave wrinkles, furrows, things like that that we can look at and uh, determine what are the reasons for that and that's the sort of like the geography of the face. So we're looking at a peanut shape and I've done a little quick sketch. I've got a, a, a little bit of a tilt because he's got a very pleasant face. Uh, Peter Sellers is Peter Sellers, one of the goons. We'll talk a little bit about him. Um, I'm not that uh, aware of the goons, I came to understand the the nature of the goons a little bit late in my life. Uh, probably I was fourteen, I think, before I heard them. And I, because I was a big lover of the Three Stooges uh, and you know routines like Abbott and Costello and things, I immediately um, uh, uh, fell in love with it. So. 
you know, you're, you're probably, uh, if you, you would do yourself a great uh, service if you were to jump onto YouTube later and um, have a look at the goons and see if they can make you um, love them as much as, uh, as I do. So, um, looking at the face, I'm zigging back and forth here, so we might, we might actually drop a lot of the details um, for the very fact uh, that, uh, you know, it's such a long way away <laughs> from, from the drawing. So, you know, it's a bit of an unknown, yeah, unknown territory here. Um, it, we, we, we may fail, we may lose the likeness, we may lose the reference to the details that we're trying to capture. Um, but I'll give it my best shot, I'll tell you that. Now, Peter Sellers, of course, came to fame with uh, films, you know, uh, like The Pink Panther, Return of the Pink Panther. Um, but really, I noticed him, he came on my radar when um, my mother actually took me to, and my sister, to the Winter Garden Theatre in Rose Bay. And um, what was showing was something that she uh, heard was a really clever um, film called The Party. Now, in The Party, it was like a party refers to a Hollywood party, and I think it was a great... I um, can't remember the name of the screenwriter, but he's like a playwright. So it's like a, a stage play, right, of the era, which is, you know, very funny, witty... Um, concepts and, and gags. A lot of the gags are visual, a lot of the gags are about the, you know, the misinterpretation of uh, cultures. Um, and um, I'll just give you a quick little backstory on why I liked it. So the party featured um, Peter Sellers in the, in the, the main role of Harundi V. Bakshi. And Harundi V. Bakshi was an Indian actor working in Hollywood and was prone to, um, you know, uh, uh, pratfalls and clumsy mistakes and things. So he blows up a set, a big castle. It's like they're filming the... Um, this is spoiler alert, by the way, if you haven't seen this film. Um, spoiler alert! So he blows up this set. And... Um, the director, or the, sorry, the producer, not the director, the producer, is, um, I think, uh, one of the, he was like the, the one of the guys from, um, one of the actors from um, the Dick Van Dyke show, I can't remember his name, but, or uh, Mary, sorry, not the Dick Van Dyke show, from Mary, which was the spin-off. So he had a lot of aggression, a lot of energy, and things like that. So it was a good foil. He had, he had a brilliant way, um, the director, who I can't remember his name for the moment, but um, he had a brilliant way of, of matching these personality types up against each other to create this dramatic uh, contrast, this dramatic um, uh, device. It was a device, right? So a certain type of uh, person is aggravated and is insensitive and selfish and all this sort of thing. So you match them against an obstacle, which is the main character. And uh, that character is, you know, very good natured. It's almost the opposite, but has things that push the other's buttons a lot. And uh, this is certainly the case of... Uh, Harundi V. Bakshi. Um, again, you know, his open-heartedness and, and good nature uh, inspires other people to, you know, um, to notice that and, you know, and that's pr probably his endearing quality. Apparently, I can't confirm this because I'm not on Wikipedia at the moment, apparently, this is what I heard, the Indian Censor, Board of Censors in India, took umbrage to 
caricaturing of Indian nationals of an Indian type and um, was a little bit unsure. I think eventually they, they allowed the, uh, the film to screen in limited cinemas. They were frightened that it would incite, um, you know, uh, anti-American or anti-Hollywood uh, sentiment. Um, they weren't sure about it, to be honest. I think it's safe to say. They were a little bit uh, nervous when it first came out. Um, and it does, in a way, it does uh, stereotype Indians the way that, you know, um, um, the Indian um, shopkeeper in The Simpsons is, is, is a stereotype. Um, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Ultimately, I think we'll have to, you know, the, the jury rests on things like that because it depends on, on what the perceived um, feeling is in the in society as a whole. Um, I certainly know malice has been, uh, uh, you know, intended from the film, from and, and especially, uh, you know, the main character Peter. But um, we, we just have to sort of see how how bad it is. I think it, because it's 1960 something, 65, 66. I think it's safe to say that it's it's a, a charming uh, characterization of somebody. Ultimately, makes you feel some you know uh, empathy for the character and appreciate his um, take on life. You know, that's what that's what I got out of it. I was very um, moved by it as a little kid watching this film, and um, I was you know very touched. And he had a very his personality came through the character and you know we loved him for it so he had some great um, catchphrases like there was uh, a, a scene where in the film where he feeds a bird uh, he's very nervous to fit into a Hollywood party right so he, his nervousness makes him you know do tr Tried, he tries to sort of fit in and tries to sort of stay out of it and try to, you know, be a bit um, aloof, a bit of... try to not to get into trouble and things like that. And the more he, he uh, tried to do that, of course, the situation developed uh, to make it more likely to happen. So... Um, Birdie Num Num is, uh, if you were to uh, Google Birdie Num Num, that's a scene where um, the bird, some, somebody uh, called the bird food, the bird seed Num Nums for Birdie. And uh, he, uh, he took it upon himself to, um, to feed the bird, of course, and uh, Hilarity ensued. Birdie num num. So he had this very thick accent and uh, proceeded to use it <laughs> for all it's worth. Um, very interesting, uh, I think. You know, most people, I have friends from India who liked uh, the character and the film very much because it had a, a, a heartwarming quality, as I said. You know, it wasn't created out of out of derision or malice. So I think that's the, sort of the saving grace of the of the film. It was based on, um, you know, the the misinterpretation of cultures and things like that. So, you know, which is a common uh, uh, area of comedy, certainly back then. You know, that, that people sort of misinterpret actions and and um, and things. So as the same, actually the same, he does characterization. You could tell that he's a character. Look how many, it's such an open book of, of wrinkles and lines in his face. It's so, it's so completely honest, you know? So everything is, there's no subterfuge here. There's, it's just such an open, look how the eyebrows turn up here, you know? The eyebrows go up and the eyes are 
in concert with that movement, you know? So when you look at that, as a human, you immediately attribute, um, you know, pathos to it. It's like sad. This is a sad look. And he had a sad life. He had a lot of anxiety and things, performance anxiety, but, you know, his, his work. And, and uh, he suffered a lot. He had a lot of uh, issues, phobias and things like that. So, um, you know, he didn't have a, a, an easygoing time. But um, we appreciate, you know, his energy and what he did, what he provided. It was a, a, a unique, his characters were uniquely um, human. And that's what we loved, you know. There's something human about Inspector Clouseau uh, that feeds us. It's, it gives us not only humor, but gives us a sense of humanity, a sense of pathos. So good humor does that. Good humor opens a valve in us. So it's not just a valve of, like to, to laugh or to be allowed to laugh. You know, it's a valve of being allowed to be human. And that's what Peter had for us. He had a valve that allowed us to feel like human beings. So his characters were, you know, masterfully constructed to uh, embody all of the um, misinterpretation, misimpressions, and misinterpretations of culture or status or. Um, uh, what else? you know, job title, whatever, um, career. It was just, he, he and, and he gave that sort of, that masterful interpretation to all of the roles that he, um, that he, he presented. You know, there's one, I think, uh, a famous one that uh, I love of his work, an English film called, I think it's called I'm All Right Jack, where it's just a series of, of, uh, events surrounding a a work stoppage, like a strike, and it's like almost like a, it's a comedy of errors, which the English do very well. Um, but it's set against like the the machinations of of companies and the machinations of u of unions. You know, they're each serving themselves, and in the end, um, they're. Um, Their motives become apparent to people, kind of like um, Alec Guinness in the, the white suit, where you had this um, this brilliant but crazy inventor, which was Alec Guinness. We should do Alec Guinness, shouldn't we? Old Obi Wan. So pointing out the the you know the issues, the foibles of of life and you know people uh, is is beautifully done in caricature uh, of personality of the of the you know in acting it's almost like a caricature of of a, a type and he did that really well beautifully beautifully you know um, what else the Pink Panther of course. Um, he played Inspector Clouseau, Clouseau the bumbling French uh, detective, uh, uh, beautifully matched by the uh, <laughs> the subtle ang ang anger of um, Herbert Long, another great uh, English actor we should draw. Um, so, uh, yeah, Peter Sellers is one of his most famous roles. Of course, uh, and other things like uh, the brilliant Kubrick. You know, I have a love-hate relationship with Kubrick, I must say. I, I kind of like um, 2001, but God, it makes me fall asleep every time I see it. I, I just can't get over it. Um, so uh, he did uh, Dr. Strangelove. Of course, Peter played, uh, you know, Dr. Strangelove and... 
and a few other characters, the President of the United States. And he does it so beautifully, this multi-character to role. And you, you know immediately who it is. It's him in another role. But it works. I don't know how. I don't know how it works, but it works. You know, and, um, and it's one of the best films I've ever seen. You know, it's very strange. Very, very strange. Um, but again, you know, it's a, it's a vehicle for the surreal the surrealness of the war room so it's, it's, it's a sort of a caricature on, on personality types and you know the, the hawks versus doves type of thing oh that's too much I should knock that back a bit um, so it's a great classic for that uh, reason and uh, who could forget um the mouse had roared, you know, with the great William Hartnell, first Doctor, Doctor Who, um, and it plays a fantastic role. And Peter, of course, plays, I think, two or three roles in that. So again, you know, he gets into these personalities, right? He does these beautiful caricatures um, of personalities, like he did with Harundi Vibakshi. So no malice intended, no no malice, no you know viciousness intended whatsoever. It's it's pure observation, and um, he used that as a vehicle for telling these stories with the character. So you're immediately um, involved in the story, you know, because of the energy and brilliance of his characterization. So characterizations sound kind of sort of like caricatures, don't they? So they serve the same purpose to sort of exaggerate to create a, a narrative, a story. Very dark eyes here. We're going to have to come back in there with a, a brush pen, I think, to help the contrast out a little bit with that. Um, just building up some of the shadows that I can see in the photograph. I'm zipping back and forth to the laptop. It's great, isn't it? The, the um, directional properties that the sinuous, the um, what do you call it, the gestural properties of the face. So it's really quite um, interesting. <laughs> Sorry, just had to look outside at the moment. So Mouse That Roared was a fantastic uh, film. It was a comment on the, you know, the the, um, the arms race, the creation of an atom bomb, and uh, the, you know, the um, the war. Um, uh, what do they call it? Um, money that. Uh, Re re rebirth money or re refit money or whatever they call it for a, a country that loses the war like Germany or something. This is kind of a, a social political gag on um, on war and warmongering and things like that. That's actually quite a common thing 
and he did that with um, with Doctor Strange as well. Uh, sorry, Doctor Strange, Doctor Strange Love. Doctor Strange is a, a different, definitely a different um, kettle of fish, isn't it? Let's try to keep my hands from dragging pigment around the uh, surface of the paper. So I'm using the grey tone paper because um, the concept of this is to use three color pencils to create a sculptural effect with um, to a tonal effect, three-dimensional drawing. So with the black pencil, of course, I'm drawing the blacks, the, the darker pop points. I constructed the, the shading, the modeling, with the brown pencil, I'm, I'm going in there subtly, not all over. I'm not outlining things. I don't want to. I don't want to outline areas with the black. That's not the, the style I'm going for. But certainly build up the contrast a little bit more. Have it a little bit more definitive. You know that would be good. Pencils are great for drawing hair um, because it's like, you know, it's like they're like hairs themselves, the lines. Um, it's fantastic for fur and hair. Yeah, that kind of suits. Um, with, as I said, I'm trying to avoid doing any kind of outlining. I just um, looking at the relative light and dark of all of these different elements and responding appropriately you know not over not going overboard with the the outlining of things of forms and things you know no, I'm not I don't want to do that because it it changes the properties turns it too linear and that's not what I'm trying to achieve with these drawings I need to you know, you've got the ability to do a beautifully toned sculptural approach to a drawing, and that's that's what I'm doing. Uh, a little bit of a twist in that pencil line, which will knock back a little bit. That's all right. So the pencil gives you the ability to be very subtle with it you know, the shading. I'm just trying to work over the brown pencil just to help it out a little bit more. Give it a little bit more contrast here and there. Just a little bit, just to help it kick out a bit, you know, create a, a dimensional approach to the drawing. Again, looking back and forth to the photograph to see what, what is appropriate in terms of the lightness or darkness of these different forms. You can get um, a little bit heavier with the around the nose and things. The concept of that is that if you have a thicker line around a curved area, it kind of looks rounder, you know. So it's, you're approximating the shadow zone that's opposite to the light. We'll get in with some uh, white pencil in a sec. I just want to try to get some more defi def definition in some of these lines that I, I want to explore. Now we've got the brilliant uh, uh, teeth area, which really quite defined. It's nice. Um, And there's some particular uh, shapes at the corners of the mouth and the folding of skin over, over the top lip into the lip area itself, you know, it's quite uh, nice. And there is a slight um, just, uh, uh, twist to the mouth. So now we can darken these lines a little bit. Um, again, look back and forth to see how dark it is. Is it consistently dark? Um, you have to 
to make value judgments about values, um, how light and dark things are, or how things should look, you know, just take your time and explore it, perhaps, uh, is a good way of looking at it. Don't immediately ex uh, take it for granted that things are what they are. They may not be what they are. They may be something else. And you may invite yourself to simplify certain areas and pour detail into other areas. So kind of like think about the T-zone again, you know. The more detail you put into the T-zone, the closer the relationship between the drawing and the reference. In other words, does it look like him? We don't know. I'm at the moment uh, more concerned with the overall um, solidity or sculptural effect of the drawing. So with the clothes, of course, I can afford to be a little bit more stylized here. Um, just put the colors in. So typically in a caricature, you have a large head, small body. That's generally accepted convention. Doesn't have to be, of course. Could be, could be the, the reverse. But um, it's generally accepted that the face is a very important component in caricature because that's where the likeness is. So that's where you focus your attention. You make that quite larger than the action or the story of the body. It would also depend on many, many different factors. There's no perfect answer to every single situation. The um, factors vary and the drawings have to accommodate the, the different um, purposes or different stories that you have to tell. You know, and then there are loose caricatures or loose likenesses and tight likenesses, tight caricatures. It just means that it's referring more to the photograph or more to the the likeness of the person and, and, and less to the um, stylization aspect or cartoon aspect. All right, so we're going to hit it with some white now. Um, let's go try the white pencil first, I think. Oops. This, you know, white... White is um, one of the softest uh, pencils, certainly with a Prismacolor. You can't really avoid that. It is, it's something that um, gives you a softer uh, line. Unfortunately, the leads tend to be brittle. So, I'll try and um, get something you can use some form of points that might work. Don't press too hard with this, of course. It'll definitely break. Oh, it's already pre-broken. So I'm not coloring in with the white, I'm establishing a hierarchy, a, a, a light and dark hierarchy. What's, what is, where is the shiniest areas of skin usually? And that's more reflective of light and therefore you respond with the, um, with the pencil appropriately to create a spotlit area, or not really a spotlit area, but a reflective area. Might also establish a, uh, like a, a reflected rim light around the form itself somewhere here and there, just to, to get a little bit of uh, difference. And of course the eyes 
again look at where the light's forming and what the texture of the the forms are telling you about where to place the light so don't just uh, assume that you're just coloring it in you're not uh, another thing to, to note is um, areas that are close to the shadow can perhaps have um, more light fall on just before the shadow hits. It kind of makes the shadow stand out more. So you build it up looking at the reference and responding to an appropriate level, an appropriate response to the stuff that you, you, that you see. You know? So it's not about coloring in. It's about analyzing, of course, teeth and all. Teeth we think are white, uh, the white of the eyes we think is white. And we tend to sort of outline them and give them a full on symbolic white, a whitening, artificial whitening. Of course, that doesn't make it look very realistic in terms of its properties and texture of that. So always leave space for. Um, uh, an even harder edged highlight over the top. Uh, I'm going to get back onto this in a second with some white um, paint from a brush, a brush pen, and I'm going to try to kick up some of these um, glossy areas a little bit more to establish a uh, harder uh, edge. So, making more making it more contrast. That's what I'm after, making a little bit more contrast. So the bumps and furrows of the folds of skin and uh, muscles and things tell us quite a lot about the expressions that are usually held by this, this great person. Um, it's actually ex exploring it like a like a cartographer, like you know, somebody exploring the landforms of a continent, of a map. You know, you're drawing a map of uh, a face. A map is a story of a, of a continent, of a land, landform. And a drawing or a, a portrait or a caricature it is a, an exploration of the landforms of the face. Come on, pencil, don't break on me now. I just want to try to get in some subtle highlights here and there. I'm not coloring all over, don't worry. I'm just trying to establish a little bit of... Remember, um, even with caricatures, think about the underlying structure of the skull, right? We know that there are areas of the skin where the skull can clearly be visible uh, in its effect. So definitely foreheads and... You know, cheekbones especially you get little sharper points of light, and sometimes around the jaws itself. So, they're things to, to consider all the time when you're working. This is like a brush pen which I'm trying to establish uh, some of the brighter spots. The reflections in the eyes would be terrific to pick up. Some of the oily areas around the eyes. The eyelids itself, of course, is, you know, a very shiny area. So we'll just apply something we hope is going to work for this stuff. Seems to work all right, a bit safe. Not too much. Make up computer. I'm 
So it's just um, looking and thinking about, you know, while you're working, not about, not just about the likeness that you're trying to achieve, but what do they actually mean, these lines? What are they telling you? What's the story of the face, right? The pencil story is telling you something. What is it? So um, with the case of uh, Peter, you know, there's an incredible sensitivity that goes into um, the analysis of character. Uh, he, he, he just, you can tell that he watches uh, a lot of people. And um, this affects his, his views, his, um, his interpretations of characters that he plays. And that level of detail gives the character believability. So the same way a caricature, the more detail you put into the caricature gives that caricature more relevance, more believability. You're not after a, f a realistic effect. We allow cameras to do that. They take photographic split second uh, view you're actually telling a longer story than a photograph can tell so you know why not think about what they mean these lines you know what what are they telling you about his personality his um, character you know speaks a lot tells a lot actually if you think about it Might even though there's not one there, I might sort of put a shine on that side just to give it a little bit of uh, dimension. Yeah, that should work all right. We've got a stronger white here, of course, which we can. Um, more opaque you can help pick out some more of these um, hot spots where we like. That should actually work fine. I think that's all right. I'm going to get some black. This is a SIG brush pen. So again, it's a, it's a flexible brush. The ink is in the, um, the handle. You squeeze it, and it comes out goes through the um, <laughs> hopefully not all at once so what I'm doing here guys is just give it a little bit of contrast a little bit of help help the black a little bit you know solid because it's pencil after all doesn't sort of fill out um, the detail too too much be careful we're not going to lose those um, little reflections of light. Yeah, a little bit. Might come back in there and repair that, but at the moment um, I think we might just leave that. The Goons are a brilliant uh, team. You know, you've got Harry Seacomb and um, gosh, I did a caricature of him and I've forgotten him already. Um, but uh, you know, they're great. Their their routines are so imaginative. You know, and they come from the. Um, an era when obviously radio was king. So a lot of the energy that they they put into the performances are, um, uh, they occur with, with voice only, you know? And 
your imagination does the rest. So it's quite daunting to think of that. You know, it's how well they can tell visual stories just by using your their voice and your imagination. And you know, it's like it's very, very different. And it's kind of a I think a testament to their abilities. You know, and how they can how they can manage that. It's not a it's not a I'm, I'm sure it's not an easy thing. It's not something that, that is you know, completely um, natural. It is for them. They just commanded that medium so well. Um, I think we might just help that. See that losing size of that highlight. We need to match it over there. It might work. And uh, I think what we'll do is. Um, I don't want to work too much over the thing, over the illustration. So I'm just going to render some patch lines in here to pick out the contrast between the the head and the background, you know, so I'm using, I'm establishing um, a stronger impression of negative space, which is the space around the subject that I'm drawing. So it's a little um, compositional tool that uh, a lot of artists use. Um, Drew Struzan actually uses it quite a lot for his sketches and movie posters and things as a device that you have the character stand in front of or pop out of this window. Um, it gives it a, a stronger sense of um, composition because we read it as, as a simple shape. It's, it's quite um, uh, a strong, simple, direct effect. And it's a, it's a, is it a trick? Would you call it a trick? I don't know, maybe, maybe a tip. You know, a fast tip. Um, Norman Rockwell, of course, used it a lot. Not this shape, but a, like a circle used for the Saturday evening post covers. Um, it's a graphic design technique. Of course, graphic design is taking, is, is synthesizing and creating a, a simpler, direct method of communication, visual communication. So this is similar to that approach. Simplification, making the communication a lot uh, faster to observe, uh, uh, um, to read. I enjoyed this. This is um, a great pleasure to to draw uh, Peter, and. Um, I'm just thinking about all the great performances that he gave us over the years. You know, it was just um, incredible um, talent and incredible body of work. And I'm very happy with the uh, result of this. Let's have a look at him before. This is him before. And this is him after. And um, that's Peter Sellers for you. And this is Franz Cantor, and I am uh, going to catch you on the flip side. Bye-bye.